Good evening and welcome back to Vegas October 1 Sound Notebook Sounds uh, Napkin Notes. And tonight we're going to have a brief discussion on the intensity or loudness of muzzle blasts and shock waves, which is commonly the, the snap you'll hear if you're close to a supersonic projectile. And uh, we're going to be comparing and contrasting them and giving you a a rough feel for what you could expect if you were in the field. All right, so let's start with our usual diagram, which is our gun, our badass AR-15 assault rifle, and uh, it produces, you know, every round fired produces your muzzle blast out here, and that muzzle blast takes propagates in concentric spheres which is shown as concentric circles here and uh, better scientists than I have determined that the power or the intensity of that wave front as it expands the same amount of energy has to cover a larger and larger surface area of those spheres and that you know the intensity is roughly proportional to the inverse square or one over the radius squared of the object in question. So uh, in this case we'd have a radius of 2 at that point and in this case we'd have a radius of 4. So if we were to measure the intensities at uh, A and B then we'd have the intensity in the case of A is 1 over 2 squared and in B it's 1 over 4 squared which uh, in the case of A is 1 over 4 in the case of B is 1 over 16 so essentially as you double your distance then your loudness decreases by the square of that doubling which is one-fourth. Alright, well how does this relate to muzzle blasts? Oh, for an AR-15 firing the usual 55 grain high-speed 223 round you can expect at one meter away a measure of intensity of about 160 decibels and I'm not going to go into what the decibel scale is it's a logarithmic scale you can look it up on Wikipedia and you need to come to grips with it to understand gunshot sh shot acoustics okay by the time you get out to No, oh, I don't know, let's say uh, 1,500 feet or 500 yards. The intensity of that has dropped way down. It's still audible. And then that brings up the question of when does it become non-audible? Well, there is no absolute number because what you hear or what you measure with the tape recorder is a function of the loudness or intensity of the signal compared to the background sound. So for example if we have a scenario where we have a bunch of screaming people and they're screaming it at about 90 dB uh, sounds and our muzzle blast comes along and it's at 36 dB we're not going to hear it because 36 dB is substantially lower than 90 dB in fact for us to, to hear something those have to be within 6 dB that's just the way the ears work now on our tape recorder you know tape recorders have a dynamic range of say 100 120 decibels and uh, it'll record the sound as it goes by 
but whether or not you can see it in a visual uh, wave thing would be a function of the type of tool you use and the amplification, uh, amplification or gain to that portion of the signal. So in this case, uh, with the difference of well over 50 dB, negative 50 dB here, between the loud sound of the screaming and the weak sound of a of a muzzle blast at 1500 feet, you're not going to hear that hear it. Um, if you were to use a spectral analysis like I do with spectrograms, you probably could see it because screams have a different waveform than uh, muzzle blasts. Uh, but you're not going to hear it. Now on the other case, if you're up here at a different point and you're only 500 feet away, then you're probably going to hear the muzzle blast because at that point the muzzle blast is probably still on the order of 100 dB or better. And, all right, and the background noise being 90, now those two are obviously reversed, over the screen you still have a plus 10 difference and it only takes a plus 6 difference. So you're going to hear it in that case. It's not going to be real clear but you're going to hear it. Okay, that's the muzzle blast. How far you can hear the muzzle blast is not a function of the distance, but a, f a function of the background noise. Now at three miles, you know, the muzzle blast is probably so weak that no amount of silence is going to, you know, be able to enable you to hear it. And uh, when you're looking up the decibel scale, you can also look up the various uh, loudness levels of whispers and normal talking and you know various things but down around 36 dB is, is a pretty quiet talking real quiet talking uh, tw 20 dB is when you're in an you know a room that's a sound room that is almost perfectly silent um, your average television is probably about 50 60 dB just as a point of reference so let's talk now about the uh, Shockwave, it's a little different. And what we're going to end up getting to here is uh, so once again we have our bullet. Whoops, I've got to draw it, not erase it. We have a bullet and it produces shock waves. And they, they combine together to form a shockwave cone. And as we uh, learned earlier, the closer you are to this bullet trajectory, uh, the shorter the propagation time. And the shorter the propagation time, uh, the louder the bullet is, or the louder the shock wave is. So for distances, you know, like a one meter, one meter away from the bullet path, you probably will get something on the order of 140 decibels which is quite loud and just like the muzzle wave those sounds go grow weaker with distance it's not an inverse square it's a more complex function but it's a sound nevertheless and that sound can be heard at large distances if the background is quiet uh, in terms of recordings and being visible I record all all the all the Vegas recordings that evening, even the ones at you know seventeen hundred feet, do record both the muzzle blast and the supersonic shocks produced by a supersonic projectile. And even though the they both are quite weak, they're still detectable using proper techniques of analysis. But in terms of hearing them, that's a whole different story. Uh, let's put our gun back in and our muzzle blast. Okay, so this muzzle blast, you know, it's starting to dissipate over time. Okay, and by the time we get way out here, you know, at, at several hundred feet, the muzzle blast is starting to get pretty weak. But And so no matter where you are, it's a simple distance thing that is how intense the muzzle blast is is a straight simple thing of distance to the 
rifle. The shockwave is not, because it too is a distance thing, but it's distance to the projectile. So if you're way out here at a thousand feet, and uh, you can barely hear, well, you know, not barely hear, but the muzzle blast is becoming weak, and you're and you're really really close to the uh, bullet, then that you're going to hear a loud 140 dB snap, and the uh, the muzzle wave on the other hand, since it's probably dropped drop down into 70 dB range, you know, it may be the case, even though they're different frequencies, uh, that you may not hear the muzzle. Yet, if there were no uh, crack dominating the scene, then you would hear the muzzle. So that brings up interesting questions. How, you know, if you're at a substantial distance away from the bullet, where there's adequate time and distance for that 140 dB to dissipate, and you're, you know, not too far away from the muzzle, then you're probably going to hear the muzzle over the crack. Or maybe you'll hear both of them, and they'll combine together to form a, a composite signal. So it's all a function of distance. And let's start doing them. This isn't to scale, but here, you know, somewhere here where the muzzle blast is still song, uh, strong, but the distance to the projectile is large, the muzzle blast is going to dominate. Uh, where you're here, somewhere closer to the path of the bullet, and the muzzle is blast is still fairly strong, but the projectile sound is also very strong, you're likely to hear both of them and then where, when you hear them is a function of when they arrive and the the supersonic projectile sound crack always arrives before the muzzle blast which always arrives before the echo of of the muzzle blast and the echo for the uh, supersonic crack can usually usually arrive before the muzzle blast but they can get intermixed because of, of the path link depending upon the elevation and, and distances so but out here, you know, um, on the order of 1,500 feet, you're probably going to be hearing mostly e hearing mostly the muzzle blast. Uh, down at around 800 feet, you're probably again going to, and you're closer to the bullet, you're going to be hearing the bullet. Uh, if you're up here at 800 feet and further away from the bullet, you're going to be hearing. Uh, mostly muzzle blast or a combination of the two. So this change in intensity of sound and the fact that as you know already uh, the times of arrival is a function of distance creates a quadruple effect of intensity of the crack, the intensity of the muzzle blast and the timing of the crack and the timing of the muzzle blast and you end up with that scenario where you'd swear that there are two guns at the same time. Uh, and that's quite common in uh, all of the um, videos that were recorded. For videos that are recorded at angles which are steep compared to the trajectory of the bullet then both the muzzle blast and the crack arrive at about the same time and so the composite signals are one but this region close to the trajectory of the bullet is the maximal uh, difference in the time of arrivals between the the uh, shock wave and the bullet and so it's quite often the case that in a burst of six rounds you'll get uh, four or five supersonics by them cracks by themselves followed by uh, two or three mixtures of supersonic crack and muzzle blast followed by uh, five muzzle blasts because the lag between the two or this, the time separation and shift is is huge. As a real example, um, and I have an extensive, in the very first video I produced I looked at volley five uh, and it was eight rounds that were fired and it was fairly close, fairly, you know, being relative thing, close to the bullet path and it wasn't so far away from the muzzles that you couldn't detect the sound audibly and what you ended up with, let's erase some of this
and we'll designate the uh, muzzle blast with red and the shock wave with green. So in the case of the volley 5 burst 3 we get 8 we got it right first we get a total of 8 supersonic cracks I think that's it is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 and one more but because of the time of arrival the muzzle blast arriving later then it comes in like this and so in this case you see that before any the first things you first hear are the supersonic cracks and then you hear a combination of both of them and then at the end you hear just muzzle oh that's wrong I drew it wrong <laughs> okay back up it would help one two three four five six seven eight and then we need four would help if I could draw huh? five six seven eight there we go that's much better because for each round you're gonna have two sounds okay so up front here you hear three supersonic cracks and then there's this overlap and then at the tail end there's just muzzle blasts so your ear given that on these first and last parts here's two distinct separate sounds because the, the muzzle blasts are lower frequency than the um, supersonic crack but in between here you know some of these could be distinguished and, and smoke but most of them would just be one sound interpreted as one sound and therein lies the confusion on most of the volleys uh, when people start hearing strange and different things and of course and then you have to add in you know the occasional hit and then you have to add in the the uh, echoes from the muzzles and you know and then maybe uh, an echo from the uh, supersonic cracks and the next thing you know you got this cacophony of sounds which to the ear is very confusing now in spectral analysis they're all quite easy to separate well quite easy they they're, can be separated because of their uh, characteristics so anyway in the field under live fire with the adrenaline rushing and everything and you have to pay attention to other things you're easily misled as to what's happening in a post forensic situation you can easily determine what actually happened and that's a wrap and we'll catch you in the next one